Hi, everybody. I'm Bobby Harrington. I have the privilege of being the uh, point leader of Renew. And with me is Orpheus Hayward. And I'm super pumped about uh, this meeting because we're going to talk about his book called God's Word that's just coming out. Uh, really important book. And uh, we're going to dive into it. But first, uh, Orpheus, let me just turn it over to you and let you bring greeting to everybody. I'm really thankful to be on this interview and certainly be grateful to be in partnership with uh, this great brother, uh, Bobby. He's just been wonderful, a tremendous visionary in regards to this project. And to be invited into this piece has been wonderful and a wonderful journey, I might add. So I'm grateful to be doing this interview and thankful to be part of such a blessing. I believe people are truly going to be transformed by this series of studies. Yeah. I'm really excited about it too, Orpheus, and really grateful for your partnership. Okay, let's let's jump in. Uh, I have some uh, serious questions and then some, well, maybe not so serious. So we'll start with <laughs> we'll start with just the generic question: Why is this study so important? You know, I think this study is important because it gives people insight into the authority of scripture and it allows them to understand that God has spoken, that God has not been silent, that he has actually provided us with the disclosure of his will. And while the Bible is not necessarily um, the disclosure of all of God's mind, it is the disclosure of God's mind as it relates to us having a relationship with him and crucial questions in regards to the Christian faith and how we should live. And so I'm excited about this book because I'm excited to hear from God. And I think everyone should be excited to hear from God. God, that's so good. Let, let, let me ask this question, um, Orpheus. Mm -hmm. It seems like the Bible is really being uh, up for grabs right now. A lot of people right. challenging its authority, especially even people who are in churches that uh, right. the churches and the church leaders are, are challenging the authority of the Bible. Why is that? Like what's happening in our culture that would cause that? You know, I think what's happening, Bobby, in, re in reference to the challenge to the authority of scripture that I believe is, as you pointed out, happening within churches and outside of churches. I believe the issue is how do we use the Bible to speak directly to our current crisis and culture? And I think when people don't get the answer they are looking for, then they end up questioning whether or not the Bible is relevant to them. I think we are very impacted by a subjective kind of theology where we want to recreate God and we want to recreate his will. And whenever God speaks and we are not in agreement with it, then suddenly we want to switch gods or switch books. And so what ends up happening is that the, the issue is not that God has not spoken and the issue is not the authority of God's word. It is our reception of that authority that is really the issue. And churches are struggling today because now the culture is putting pressure on the church to conform to what is the norm of the culture. And as a result, we are watering down the authority of scripture. And I think it's a very dangerous posture for churches to get into this space where the culture becomes the authority and the the culture puts our pressure to make us kind of fit within their norms. So I'm hoping that this study is going to help churches, pastors, and even people outside the church become reacquainted with the authority of scripture and realize that God's Bible is relevant to the culture. And it is the answer for us to have in regards to the crisis that we're in. Oh, that's good. Hey, Orpheus, I have a serious question for you. Is that an Ottawa Senator's uh, label on your coat? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, it is the it is the logo of the Christian school I work for, uh, uh, Greater Atlanta Christian School, and uh, okay. this is this is their logo. And they are one of the proverbial statements they have borrowed is they are Spartans, and oh. many people are are familiar with Spartans and the story of regards to the Fearless Three Hundred and things of that nature. And so they take that logo and they say we are Spartans. So yes, this is the logo of Greater Atlanta Christian. School. Oh, okay. The Ottawa Senators hockey team has a similar yes. one. I, think. Yeah. So I was I was about to think, oh, Orpheus, you're a hockey fan <laughs> like I am. <laughs> Actually, you're from New York originally, correct? I am. I am originally from New York. Oh, that's great. 
All right, let's get back to the book. Um, Orpheus, let, I want to I want to get to to this question. Um, a lot of people have questions about how did we get our Bible, and uh, they think that maybe somehow it didn't get to us reliably. So yeah. if you were to summarize why you have confidence that the Bible came to us as God intended, how would you summarize that? Um, I would say that the Bible, you should put the Bible to the same test that you would any ancient document. So there are many ancient documents in regards to, uh, and we ask the question, are they reliable? such as the Iliad or such as um, uh, various other writings that were written by Tacitus. These were all historians that wrote uh, that wrote documents and we test their reliability through a couple of ways. One way we know that we have reliability in regards to an ancient document, we ask the question, um, one, um, how many copies do we have of that original document? And it helps us to realize if we have copies of that original document, then we know that we can compare these copies to ascertain what was the original wording. So the more copies you have, the better textual criticism you can do to ascertain what was the original reading of that particular document. Um, the, the other thing we like to ask is not only um, how many copies do we have, but the proximity of the copies. That means um, how long after the original was the copies written? Because the further away from the original that the copies were written, then there could be some less reliability in that regard. So if you got an original and then the first copy is not till a thousand years later, then maybe you would have some concern as to whether or not um, that copy was um, as accurate, not as accurate, but whether it was an accurate depiction of that original. It is interesting that when it comes to the New Testament and the Bible itself, we have more copies of the original than any other other ancient document. If you took the New Testament itself, we have 25,000 plus copies of the original, which means that we're able to ascertain what was the original wording of the first document. We have excellent uh, manuscript attestation, as we call it. So we know that with 25,000 copies of the original, we're pretty sure we got God's word. And we're, we're really sure that we're reading what God intended us to read. Not only that, but we have copies of these documents with Within 50 years of the original, which is pretty close proximity, which tells us, again, that we, we can be very sure that we have what God intended us to have. So the reason I trust the Bible, the reason I trust the documents is because we have excellent manuscript attestation of those original documents. There are no originals today, but we know we have great copies of the originals. And to that end, we can trust the message that has been given to us by God and know that we have the original readings at our hands. Oh, that's good. So Orpheus, um, the Bible says uh, of itself that it's inspired by the Holy Spirit. Uh, yes. So it's like a, it's a claim that it's like somebody can make a claim about themselves. It doesn't necessarily make it true. Sure. But why, how should I think about that as somebody who's reading the Bible You've got like in uh, Second Peter chapter one, you know that uh, the Holy Spirit carried along people uh, yes. so that they spoke God's word. Um, how should I think about that in terms of the inspiration and authority of Scripture? It's a great passage where Peter really gives a, a an exclamation that the Holy Spirit carry men along as or as the King James says, as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Of course, I'm, I, I like the King James, but I certainly like my contemporary translations a bit more for, for, for good reason, I think. But I like how the King James words that one. It says hope men spake as they were moved. And as you yeah. indicated, carried along by the Holy Spirit. I love how that sounds very poetic. Um, but what we can do with that is we can look at how the Bible gives one of the greatest evidence of inspiration, and that's prophecy. When you look at how these men spoke prophetically and what they prophesied came to pass exactly as they indicated, and it was hundreds of years, sometimes more, where they made these prophecies, and then it happened as they said, it is evidence of inspiration. So the self-claim that the Bible is inspired is backed up by the historical claim that it actually came to pass exactly as the prophet spoke. The other thing we have is excellent historical corroboration with the Bible. The Bible 
is a very historical book and it can be corroborated by external historical documents, which shows that the Bible is actually accurate in its historical claim. So we have prophetic evidence, we have historical evidence, and my God, we have archaeological evidence that also backs up the Bible. So the Bible's claim to inspiration is actually backed up by archaeology, history, and prophecy. Mm, and I think okay. just those three things by itself really shows that the Bible is in fact um, God's word. Oh, that's good. That's really good. Okay, so uh, if if the Bible has good attestation, uh, it claims to be inspired by the Holy Spirit, there's good uh, archaeological and other background to it, then the question becomes, how can I, somebody living in contemporary society, what are some things I need to know so that I can correctly interpret the Bible? You have a chapter in there called, How Do We Interpret yeah. the Bible? What are some key yeah. things that come out of that? You know, one of the things I love, uh, you know, my degree is in theological exegesis. I have a, an affinity for hermeneutics and interpretive processes. And what I try to help people understand about interpretation is that they're already experts in interpretation. You know, we read text messages all day. We read newspapers. <laughs> we read, you know, and we have to interpret these things. What makes it interesting is that we know that in order to understand anything we get, we need to understand the genre in which it comes to us. You don't really read the editorials of the newspaper the same way you read the comics because you know there's two different genres so you approach it differently um when you're reading a a, po a poetry piece you might read poetry you know that you don't treat poetry the same way you treat a historical narrative we already know this the only difference is that when we come to the bible we need to recognize what are the genres of scripture and then we need to make sure we respect its context and we need to make sure we come at it with some level of common sense as we read it and i could give people a lot of lofty techniques for that but i believe you're already an expert so here is my advice read the bible contextually historically and you read it respecting the genre in which you're getting it. Is it a letter? Is it a historical narrative? Is it poetry? Is it wisdom literature? And I think once you understand that, you approach it that way, and then you can get from the Bible its intended meaning. So I really believe in trying to understand the Bible uh, according to its context and its author's intent, uh, and really God's intent first and foremost, but he used humans to write the text. So we try to get into what's called the authorial intent. So so that we're not understanding the context. You can never make a verse mean what it never meant. So mm -hmm. we want to know what did the verse mean, and then we apply it according to what it means. And so that's the way we start to get into the into the subject of interpretation. And I believe, and you don't have to be a scholar. Anybody can pick up the Bible, read it with context in mind, and I believe you will get the message God intends for you. Yeah, that's good. Hey, what did you like most about writing the book? You know, when I wrote this book, first, I wrote it under great distress. Um, I, I went through some really heavy things during this book. It made it difficult for me, but it was good because it reminded me about who it is that I serve. And writing this book made me fall in love all over again with the beauty of God's word. And while I was going through things with my daughter and things in my family and, and just things in life, it was a real hard time during pandemic. And writing this book, it was like a reminder of, God is who he said he is. God has spoken. I can have hope because God's word gives me hope. And it helped me to get back into the beauty of just reading scripture and, and appreciating the fact that God did not leave me without his voice. And mm. so that was kind of the best part of doing this again is that it was a healthy reminder to a full-time pastor that you need to remember that I am in fact who I said I am and my word is sufficient for whatever you're going through. Yeah, and like that, that was the beauty of writing this book. Ooh, I like that. Hey, yeah. uh, you had some kind words as we began about being a part of Renew. Of course, you're by writing uh, the book, you're a part of the whole series and part of our movement. Um, how do you feel about uh, Renew and especially, and, and this is not planned or anything, but especially um, um, I really want to be uh, multi-ethnic, multi-racial. How do you feel about that? Yeah, I think Renew, um, which I am 
um, new to the movement, as I wrote this book, I became acquainted with Renew through recommendation, as a matter of fact. Um, a good friend of ours, Doug Crozier, uh, helped to introduce us. And um, it gave me an opportunity to do some reading on the website. And then just meeting Bobby, guys like you and others. Um, what I love about Renew and those involved with Renew is there is a respect and a and a loyalty and a commitment to biblical Christianity. And that is a passion for me. I am a firm believer and committed to the beauties of New Testament Christianity yeah. and all that it affords us. And I am a big proponent of going back to the Bible to ascertain what it is that God would have us to do. And Renew does that. It believes in that. And it accentuates that in its writings, in all of its articles. And so I found a home here in Renew because we share in the same commitment to New Testament Christianity and the principles of restoration movement, just wonderful principles. And we just thank God for this movement and what it means. In terms of the broader picture, I love Renew.org's openness to racial diversity, its openness to a to the God who includes us all, and the the beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ being a gospel of, of inclusion is accentuated by the individuals that are part of this movement. So I truly love being part of Renew. I love its commitment to scripture. Uh, it is very orthodox in its approach, and I'm appreciative of that. And we are the kind of organization that believes in, let's see what God says. And yeah. that's what I appreciate. Yeah, boy, that's that's so wonderful. So uh, so good to hear you say those things. So I want to encourage everybody to get the book on Amazon.com. Uh, I have a couple of closing questions. The first one is, um, if you could only eat one food the rest of your life, what would it be? Oxtails. Oxtails. <laughs> yes, that is that is what I grew up on. My mother is a tremendous cook and oxtails was kind of the the pinnacle and climactic meal in our house and uh, oxtails are just just a wonderful food uh, if, if you take everything else away you can't take away oxtails so uh you and i were on a tv show with jason whitlock a couple weeks ago yeah and my wife said to me he has such a wonderful voice so my question <laughs> is how long have you had that wonderful voice you know what ever since i Pretty. I think it kicked in out there with um, You know, this has kind of just been my voice. And uh, it's amazing. I can go to a store and it's really weird and spooky because people will say, hey, you must be a pastor. And I'm like, what are you talking about? They say, you sound like one. I don't know what a, I don't know what a pastor sounds like, but this has been the voice that God gives me. And I tell you, Bobby, I'm just thankful that he gave me a voice to speak for him. And uh, there's no greater privilege. Isn't that the truth? Orpheus, yeah. it's been wonderful to be with you. Do you have any uh, last comments uh, for those who are watching this, who are thinking of getting the book? Uh, just any last comments? You really need to get this book. I'm going to ensure that my church goes through the series, and I'm excited to get them to go through the series. Um, you want to do this for your own personal growth. You really owe yourself the favor of getting access to books that are like I, I use the word orthodox i really just mean it's healthy teaching and it's going to help you to expand your christianity and it's going to help you to mature and better than that it's going to help you to understand why you believe what you believe sometimes you believe the right thing but don't know exactly why well this book is going to give you the why uh, mm -hmm. all of these books are going to give you that why so you can say okay not only do i believe this I know why I believe it, and I have answers. And so you're going to really love this series. Make sure you get the whole thing. No, oh, that's great. Well, Orpheus, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for writing this book. And we look forward to what God's going to do with it. All right. Thank you so much, Bob.